My name is Dan and I'm one of the pastors here at HDBB. Today we're going to look at two passages of scripture. We're going to look at the opening verses of Romans chapter 8, which is one of the great promises of our faith. And then we're going to look at the opening story of John chapter 8, which shows us what this promise looks like as we receive it for ourselves. Recently, I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks. I don't know about you, but the days involve a lot of screen time at the moment, so it's quite nice to have something to wind down to at the end of the day that gives your eyes a rest. And I uh, found this storybook that I've been meaning to listen to for a while, which is called The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. It's a slightly strange story, sort of science fiction, and uh, it was written in the last century. Um, but the only weird thing about this story is the narrator is an actor who read the children's books that I used to listen to as a kid uh, when I would listen to cassette tapes as I went to sleep at night. So it's slightly disconcerting because what he's saying is quite surreal, but the sound of his voice is quite comforting. It's a little, a little bit jarring. It kind of reminds me of the situation we're in at the moment. Stay at home, quite comforting. Stay at home all the time, a little bit strange. But anyway, uh, The Metamorphosis is this story about a guy called Gregor. And the opening line is this. As Gregor Samza awoke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a giant insect. It's not a true story, by the way. Uh, and the rest of the story is about him trying to adapt to this new way of life uh, and struggling with this idea that how can people like him or love him as an insect? And he ends up withdrawing from his family, his friends and his work until eventually he dies. It's quite a mood booster. And there are many interpretations of this story, but the one that makes most sense to me is that if you do not trust that opening line, if you see that the opening line is a lie, the rest of the story makes sense. In other words, Gregor Samza didn't wake up to find himself transformed into a bug. He just believed that he had been transformed into a bug. He believed that he was unworthy, that people couldn't love him or like him. And once he'd condemned himself, even though it wasn't true, it still played out as if it was. And this is a powerful picture for us as to what can go on in our own lives when we allow ourselves to be condemned, when we condemn ourselves. Because even though it is not true that God does not condemn us, if we believe that it is, it will still play out as if it was, even though it is a lie. And what I want to speak about today is the lie of condemnation. As Michael Ramsden said last week, uh, this big global pandemic has caused a lot of introspection, a lot of self-evaluation, which is really helpful a lot of the time. It can be helpful in helping to refine our lives, to work out what's good and what's fruitful. But it can also go into a sort of kind of beating yourself up, self-condemnatory place. And I've chatted with a lot of people who've been struggling with this. And I think Partly it's because, I mean, we're all flying blind, right? None of us are experts in this. And, and as well, a lot of the markers that we used to know how we were doing in the past, those have been removed. As such, business is tricky, relationships are strained, and it's easy in this time to feel like you're failing and to condemn yourself. And what I believe the Lord would help us to receive today is this truth that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the promise that is found right at the center of the book of Romans in the Bible. And you can kind of think it as, of it as the turning point of the book of Romans. Up until this point in the book, Paul, the author, has been talking about the situation we find ourselves in. And it's the, the best illustration I have for it. It's, a, it's an oldie, but it's a golden. Is, is this, that God created us to have a perfect, unbroken relationship with him. Uh, and imagine this hand represents you and me, and we, we enjoy an unbroken relationship with God. Uh, now, the problem is we do things that break that relationship. We, we sin. Let this book represent our sin. Well, well actually, it's probably more like this, if, if you're me. This book represents our sin, that we do things our own way. And it, it causes a barrier between us and God. And also it weighs us down. We are weighed down in condemnation. 
because there's nothing we can do. We, we can't remove this, even when we do things that are good. That, I mean, that's not a bonus. It's just what we were supposed to be doing anyway. And so we're stuck. And in the book of Romans, it talks about the fact that God didn't leave us in this way, trapped, that he sent his son, Jesus, who enjoyed, this, this hand represents Jesus, he enjoyed an unbroken relationship with Jesus. And on the cross, he took on all of our sin and our condemnation, and he died in our place. He was cut off from his father in heaven. He was condemned. But do you see where that leaves us? That leaves us able to enjoy a relationship with God again, free, no longer condemned, set free to enjoy a friendship with our Father in heaven. Now, the rest of the book of Romans, starting with chapter eight, goes on to describe that life in the spirit, the life that in the spirit that Michael spoke about last week, the, the, the life in the spirit that we're going to celebrate next week as we celebrate Pentecost together. And Miles is going to speak about what life in the spirit looks like in community. But Paul puts this line right at the beginning of Romans chapter eight. There is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because understanding that is the gateway to receiving this life in the spirit. Because even though we are not condemned, if we believe that we are, if we believe that this barrier is still on us, even though it's not, it will inhibit us from enjoying that relationship. Think of it like if you think somebody at the workplace is annoyed at you and angry at you, even if it's not true, that will still change your behavior towards them. It's the same with God. If you think that, oh, of course God loves me, but he doesn't really like me. And obviously he's probably pretty annoyed about the cross still. And like, you know, he, you know, he, he, he puts up with me, but I'm basically a bug. I'm basically like a, a, a problem for him. Then that's going to inhibit your relationship with him. The truth is there is therefore now no condemnation. The barrier is gone for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul then goes on to explain how this works. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And one of the most amazing examples of what that looks like fleshed out in life is found in a story in the Gospel of John, in the story of Jesus' life written by the Apostle John. That we, and we find it in uh, John chapter 8, the story of the woman caught in adultery. Let's read it together. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand up before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis to accuse him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older one first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Amen. At different times, we find ourselves as different people in this story. Sometimes we are like those in the crowd with a rock in our hand that we would like to throw at others. Other times we are like the religious leaders with a rock in our hand that we would like to throw at God. And sometimes we are like that woman, likely condemning herself for the choices and the decisions she's made. And in that moment, whether that rock in our hand, that rock of condemnation is a rock that we want to throw at others or at God 
or even ourselves, this passage says the same thing to us. Drop the rock. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Firstly, drop the rock you would like to throw at others. Condemnation is a boomerang. It always ends up going in the opposite direction. When you throw it at others, it always comes right back at you. We read, they made her stand before the group and she said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And I think, let's be honest, that's a bit weird. They kind of come boasting about the fact that they caught her in the act. I kind of think they probably have more issues than she does. And they bring her before Jesus. They didn't need to do that. They didn't need to bring her and make her stand in front of everyone, but they do. And she is disheveled and she is defenseless. And really, it's kind of a picture of what can go on in our heads when we get angry at someone. Uh, I don't know about you, but when you have an argument with somebody in your head and you construct a watertight case against them and they're totally at your mercy and you're going to sling the rock of condemnation at them. And they say, we caught her and the law says we should stone her. What do you say, Jesus? And his reply is, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And he's got them. In other words, he's saying, like, who here is qualified to be her judge? He's totally snookered them. And, it, you know, in the condemnation of others, we end up condemning ourselves. In this case, like adultery is a form of theft. You're taking somebody else's spouse, but killing is the same. You're taking somebody else's life. So they're, they're both doing the same thing. He's got them there. But also they're quoting the law. But last time I checked, it takes two to tango. Where's the guy? They have haven't brought him. They're claiming the law, but partial justice is an injustice. She broke the law, but they're about to break the law too. Condemnation is a boomerang. Elsewhere in the book of Romans, Paul says that whatever point you pass judgment on somebody else, you condemn yourself because you, do, you too do the same thing. It's been said that whenever you point the finger, there are three fingers pointing back at yourself. And what this means is drop the rock of condemnation that you're tempted to throw at others. And to be honest, I know that I don't really need to say this to you. I love being part of this church because you're so encouraging and you're so kind. Like one example, when we first started doing church online, the first few weeks in the, in the chat bar, we got one or two trolls who started being a bit mean in the discussion and everyone responded with such kindness and, and such gentleness. And eventually the trolls got bored and trolled off. Uh, but this passage is timely for us because in this season, there's going to be a lot of rock throwing going about at politicians, at leaders, at scapegoats. And we don't have to join in. We are all in the same boat. We are all fallible and fragile people. We are all dust. So never be stingy with mercy. Never be stingy with mercy. It's easy to fill our pockets with rocks, but they'll just weigh you down. And then when you fling them, they'll hit you in the face. So drop the rock you would like to throw at others. Secondly, drop the rock you would like to throw at God. The religious leaders come with a question, but they're not really being that honest. We read this. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. There are times in life that like these religious leaders, we get angry at God and we want to try and condemn him. Now, the reason these guys are getting angry at God and the reason that, that I do sometimes is because they think that they have power and they think that Jesus is going to take away that power. And, and I know for me, it's like I've got a little religious leader in my heart that sometimes gets worried that God doesn't have my best interests at heart, that he's probably a spoil sport. And if I let him call the shots, then things won't be as good. And so I try and keep him at arm's length. And I say, you know, if you come near here, I will throw this rock at you. And so they come to Jesus with this moral dilemma. And to be fair, it's a good one. This is like a first century escape room, basically. They, they quote the law accurately, but all of this 
is just a show to hide the real problem that, that they worry about losing power to Jesus. See, it's not wrong to have questions. In fact, doubt and questions are an essential part of faith. But we're invited to drop the rock that treats us as if we are God's judge and instead come to him as he invites us to come to him as a friend. A, a friend with questions, but not a, a friend who comes to, for, to judge with those questions, but to ask them honestly, to say, God, look, this is my offense. This is my sadness. This is my pain. And, and would you take this from me? Do you know what? There is nothing that passes through your heart that is unworthy of bringing before God in prayer. Use the offence, use the hurt and turn it into prayer so that you can go deeper in your friendship with him. See, this story is filled with surprises. And probably the most surprising thing, probably for our generation, the, the surprise is not that the woman doesn't get condemned because we, we, we kind of champion the victim. We're, we're quite permissive when it comes to moral failure. Really, the surprise for us is that Jesus does not condemn the condemners. See, that's the way the world tends to work. You know, somebody does something wrong, they say something out of place on social media, and then everybody piles in on them and you just fight fire with fire, they condemned, and so we're gonna condemn and cancel you. But the amazing thing is, Jesus does not do that. He does not condemn the condemners, but he convicts them. And you have this beautiful moment in verse nine, and we read, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. He doesn't condemn them, but he does convict them. What's the difference? Uh, a week or so ago, we, Kate and I were putting our kids to bed and we were going through our normal uh, evening routine, settling them down, changing nappies, putting pajamas on, singing a little song, saying a little prayer. And then we were uh, quietly just tidying up the room as they settled down. And Kate was just picking up a few things and she, she went to pick up one of the nappies that I had just changed and went to throw it into the bin. The only thing was, I hadn't tied up the nappy. And so as she threw it across the room, it unfurled like some kind of horrific flower and ejected its contents across the entire room. We went from this, ah, oh, lovely, quiet moment to, oh my goodness, it's everywhere. And some of it landed on my shirt. Now, condemnation says this, this shirt is ruined. We must burn this shirt. We must destroy this shirt. We must never speak of this shirt again. Conviction says this shirt needs a wash. That's the difference between condemnation and conviction. Jesus calls out her sin. He, he doesn't just say it's fine, but it's not to condemn her, it's to convict her so that she might enjoy life in all its fullness, to enjoy true living. Condemnation is vague and all encompassing. It says you are no good, you were never any good and you will never be any good. It's like a big black cloud whereas conviction is like a surgeon's knife. And it might be painful, but it brings life. The amazing thing is God has dropped the rock. He had every right to condemn us, but instead he cho chose to be condemned in our place. The crowd catch this woman to catch her out, but God, whenever he catches us in our sin, is to catch us and break our fall so that he can save us. God has dropped the rock that he could have thrown at us. And therefore, the last thing that this means is that that means we should probably drop the rock that we want to throw at ourselves. Drop the rock that you're tempted to throw at ourselves. See, at the start of this story, it looks like the woman is gonna get condemned. Then there's a shift and it looks like Jesus is gonna get condemned. And then it looks like the crowd is gonna get condemned. And at every point, Jesus dismantles the condemnation and responds with mercy and grace. And then it finishes with him turning back to focus on the woman. 
And he says this, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. The ones who would condemn her couldn't, and the one who could condemn her wouldn't. And then he turns to her and he turns to us and he asks, where are your accusers? And the strange thing is, sometimes the answer is here, because we accuse ourselves. Now, I think there are a few reasons why we do this. One is we think it's a good way of controlling our behavior. We think, you know, a little bit of condemnation, a little bit of shame, a little bit of I slap you kindly will keep us on the straight and narrow, but it doesn't work. Conviction will never lead to self-harm, but condemnation always does. And, and also, the way you speak to yourself is the way you'll end up speaking to others. Condemnation is a boomerang. And so a good rule of thumb is to never speak to yourself in a way that you wouldn't speak to a friend. Or an even better rule is to never speak to yourself in a way that Jesus wouldn't ever speak to you. We're told that a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Jesus knows that condemnation won't stop you from sinning. What will stop you from sinning? Knowing that you've got an advocate in heaven, that any time you mess up, any time you make a mistake, Jesus turns to the Father and he says, don't worry, I've got this covered. I'll take the hit, I'll take their place. And then he says to us, go and sin no more. The second reason is I think people condemn themselves because they think they kind of deserve it. You know, we make mistakes and we think I deserve to be punished for this. And this story shows that that, that's just beside the point. Look at this story. This woman deserved a punishment. Yeah, she is a victim, but she's also a perpetrator. She's a homewrecker. She's taken somebody else's husband. That is the kind of person that Jesus defends. That is the kind of person that Jesus goes in to bat for. That is the kind of person that Jesus lays his life down for. He, he, whenever there's mess, he, he races in. He, he's like the boomer when uh, to, running towards a house fire. He, he's like uh, the frontline workers going into hospital each day at the moment. He leans in to the mess. He doesn't run away. And John has a little play of words here because the word used for court means to apprehend, but it also means to comprehend. They apprehend her in the act, but Jesus comprehends everything there is to know about her, and yet he lays his life down for her. Jesus has dealt with everything that we deserved, meaning that instead all that is left for us is grace. And the last reason I think that we struggle and we sometimes condemn ourselves is because we still struggle. We still have temptations and sometimes we give in and we're aware of the consequences of our mistakes. And it's important to acknowledge there are sometimes consequences. It doesn't say there are no consequences for those in Christ Jesus. Like if you kick a dog, God won't condemn you, but the dog still may bite you. There are consequences, though sometimes even in his grace, God intervenes with those. But people also say, I'm tempted and I do it again and again. I don't do what I want to do and I do do what I don't want to do. But again, this doesn't nullify what Jesus has done for you. This is what Paul means when he says, there is no condemnation for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You can think of it a bit like gravity. The law of gravity is what's keeping us all on the floor at the moment, it's acting on us. But when you get into a plane and the plane takes off and flies through the air, it's not that the law of gravity stops working on you, It's that a new law, the law of aerodynamics, is now acting on you. And the law of aerodynamics is a stronger law than the law of gravity, and so you fly. 
you know, there, there are no Christians who would say, yep, never tempted, never struggle, never sin. You know, we all feel the pull of temptation. We all still feel the pull of the law, but now there is a greater law, the law of the spirit of life that is at work in our lives. Possibly a more biblical illustration than this is that in the Old Testament, we're told time and time again that he will help us soar like on the wings of the eagles. And isn't that a wonderful picture? Gravity still works on eagles, but a more powerful law, the law of aerodynamics is at work on them, and so they fly. And what's even more beautiful about that picture is Eagles don't really do much either. Like it's not you will soar on wings like geese. Geese do a lot of flapping. It's very hard work. But an eagle just unfurls its wings and lets the wind do the work. That is a picture of what we were invited into. That is what the woman experienced. The law had a demand on her. She deserved to be condemned along with the man she'd been with. But Jesus's law of love and forgiveness and grace was also at work in her life. And it saved her from death and brought her into new life. And that is what he wants to do for you too. And all she had to do was receive. I have a friend called Dan who, uh, he became a Christian about just over a year ago now. And uh, Dan's in our online alpha group at this uh, moment, which has been great uh, running alpha online. We've got four time zones represented, uh, KL, Mumbai, Frankfurt, and London. Hello, if you're watching, it's a, a really global conversation. And a few weeks back, we were talking about the cross in our discussion time. And Dan shared this story. He shared about, about 10 years ago, his business uh, uh, went into administration. And he said every day he would wake up and as he looked at himself in the mirror, he would condemn himself. He would curse himself. He would speak vulgar things over himself for, for the mistakes he'd made and, and for the impact that that had on other people. Uh, and then a friend invited him onto Alpha and he came and he became a Christian. And then last year we baptized him at HDBB. And he shared that, about two weeks after his baptism, he was brushing his teeth one morning and looking at himself in the mirror. And suddenly he was like, eh, I don't condemn myself anymore. I don't speak those things over me anymore. They were totally gone. And it wasn't anything that he had done. It was that just now he is in Christ. And once you're in Christ, there is no condemnation. And the Spirit had set him free. That's what the woman experienced in this story. It's what Dan experienced as he put his trust in Jesus. And it's what Jesus wants each and every one of us to have today. Amen. Why don't we pray? So you might like to stand now. And uh, as a sign, uh, you might find it helpful to put your hands out in front of you. And really, it's just a sign of saying, Jesus, I've got nothing to bring, but I've got everything to receive. And I want this promise that you have for me today. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you love me. Thank you that you like me and that you died in my place. I receive what you have done for me on the cross, either for the first time or afresh today. I thank you that because of you, there is no condemnation. That heavy book is gone and I can enjoy a relationship with you. Jesus, show me what that means. And as we approach Pentecost, help me take hold of everything that you have for me. All of this life in the spirit, life in all of its fullness, not so that just I would be blessed, but also so that all those around me would be as well. Come Holy Spirit, we wait for you.